as uh, you spend some time to focus on the content of ATA uh, this week, you cannot find anyone more qualified to address and lead air mobility in the critical months and years right ahead of us. It is my honor now to introduce General Ray Johns. Thank you. Thank you, sir. General Cross, members of the ATA, I'd like to introduce a new member of the family if I can. Today, General Will Frazier, our new TRANSCOM commander, is able to join us. He would have been with us for the week, but again, he's had several trips to D.C. In fact, he's leaving here to go back to D.C., out in Colorado, as we did some series of meetings. So we're very fortunate that he was able to join us today, but more importantly, join this family. He's been in the Air Force for decades, as a senior leader should be. Seven joint tours. He's come to us from Air Combat Command. I have worked for him, served for him several times. So ladies and gentlemen, we put a round of applause for General Will Frazier, our new TRANSCOM commander. Please stand up. Now, I want you to all, as you did welcome him, I'd like you to all meet him. Not all 4,000 this weekend, but in the coming evening and stuff, please go up and introduce yourself and tell them a little bit about what you do. In today's discussion, in fact, let me start with an image. Jake? I would say faces of some of the people you've touched. I would say stories of some of the lives you've affected, histories that you have written. But too often, we don't get to see the people we touch, the people we affect. We often talk about what we do. We deliver hope, we fuel a fight, and we save lives. But today, I want to go to a different level. I want to talk about why do we do what we do. Chief Kaiser and I, and before Chief Spector, we go around and we spend hours talking to our airmen, thousands, and we ask you a simple question. What do you love about what you do? Why do you do what you do? And what you come back is so simple and so profound. Sir, we answer the call. We answer the call of others so they can prevail. Something so simple, something so powerful. And so we want to talk about that, but the question will be, is this something new, or is this something that's been part of our ethos for years? We just haven't articulated it. 
The second thing we want to do today is talk about some of the people, some of the faces you've touched, some of the stories that you've written, some of the histories, and more importantly, to give you a glimpse of what it means when you do that as a place forward. How do you affect and shape things that you have no idea about? So simply, we want to talk about how proud we are of you. And the focus really is, let me hold the mirror up. Let me hold this mirror up to you of what we see every day so you can see how proud we are of what you do and more importantly, why you do it. But first, who are we? We talked last year, we're 135,000 active guard and reserve and civilians. We have our industry partners, but this year I want to add a new group. I want to add our commercial partners, our commercial carriers. Our commercial carriers fly 90% of our passengers, 37% of our cargo. Huge. And something I've learned being out with our commercial partners of how committed they are, how patriotic they are to accomplishing our mission, to being with us in everything that we do. But we often talk about the machine, the aircraft, but the machine, the aircraft has no heart. It's cold steel and titanium and aluminum. It's really about the people. It's our airmen, our porters, our maintainers, our operators, our intel, our tactics. They're the heart of what we do. And what do these people, what do we focus on? We focus on those who depend on us. We focus on soldiers on the ground. We focus on families. They can be in Japan, they can be in the US, who are recovering from natural disasters. It's maybe citizens, like in the case of those in Libya. And all they want to do is a chance to court, to um, basically determine their own course of their own nation, their own lives. Like we said before, everything we do is focused on somebody else. We'll never be the subject of the sentence. We'll never be the banner. Those that we support will, because they depend on us. And we will say yes we can to whatever we need to, to answer their call. And is it in high demand? Are we busy? Last year we talked about 2010. We talked about a plus up in Afghanistan, the drawdown in Iraq. We had to mobilize just to do that. We had then the uh, Haiti earthquake, followed by the earthquake in Chile, followed by the worst oil spill in the history of our nation, followed by two million people being displaced in Pakistan as we helped them because of the floods, followed by Kyrgyzstan saying, change the government, take the tankers out. Oh yeah, followed by this thing that there was, there was uh, volcanoes in Iceland, they erupted, they shut down the entire Atlantic flow. In the course of a phone call, we turned the entire flow through the Pacific. Amazing what we can do. And we said, my gosh, I get exhausted just trying to recap that. And yet we'd say we'd never see that again. And we believed that until March came this past year. March Baptist, not because we're watching football games, but because we were so busy. What was going on in March? We had to support the 30,000 soldiers and Marines in Afghanistan, the plus up. We still had the drawdown occurring in Iraq as we started thinking about that. We had the largest rotation of ground forces that we've done. We had three major exercises in the Pacific, in Korea, Singapore, and Thailand. We had a presidential movement going through the entire continent of South America. We had the largest AEF rotation as we swapped out and reset the fighter force and the bomber force. And then we started getting concerned about things in Egypt, Tunisia, what's happening in Syria, Bahrain. What's happening in Libya and even in Ivory Coast? Because we know if things are going to happen, we'll be there to help move somebody in, move somebody out, or move equipment in. So we did all of this mission analysis. It was amazing, all the planning. And then the call came, but it wasn't from where we thought. It was from halfway around the world in Japan. Because an earthquake, 9.0, a tsunami, 530 miles an hour, tore across Japan. And we were called out to help. The fall went under General Field, General North, Admiral Willard, to help them answer that call. And the call was a triple header for us. Humanitarian assistance, we know how to do that. March Air Force Base, boom, they go grab the Los Angeles search and rescue team, air refuel, and they're there immediately. Food and water, and helping out there. And we know how competent the nation was of Japan, so they were able to be so much more self-sufficient than other nations. But then quickly, the concern became about those radi the uh, nuclear reactors. Are they stable? What are we going to do? So we're flying in boron. We're flying in dosimeters, and actually a Navy nuclear reaction assessment team to help them determine the outcome of these reactors. And then our family members are getting concerned. What's really going on? Should we be there? So there was a, an evacuation allowed 
of military family members. We thought there would be up to 90,000 family members who wanted to come back and be with their families in the States. And we were busy with the gray tails, so we called on our commercial partners. But again, oh, by the way, it's spring break. By the way, access to those aircraft is pretty hard, but they responded. Within hours, they're starting to put crews and crew rests and move commercial aircraft to Japan. And we started flowing into Seattle, but we overwhelmed Seattle. So very quickly, we went to Travis, because all the aircraft were gone. And at Travis, amazing. Aircraft were coming in there, and this was the family's first respite from leaving Japan. And what warmed my heart probably the most, not all the sorties and all that, was the way the airmen and the way the civic leaders, honorary commanders, folks like Sandy Person from Travis Air Force Base. Sandy, stand up, please. OK. What they did is they went out around the community, and they said, you know what? This is probably the last chance for these families to make a commissary and get diapers. Oh, and by the way, there were dogs who were stressed out and would end with dog bites. We turned Travis into a family support center to ensure that those families would feel supported, feel nurtured as we put them on to go to their families. And you couldn't have done it better. It's about the community and the airmen coming together. And while this was happening, we were still focused on Afghanistan. Airdrop, so important. In fact, let me tell you probably about the first airdrop call. Unit was forward. And they actually got surrounded by the enemy. And they made a call, help. We're surrounded. I'm not sure we're going to make it through. Two lieutenants, Gettler and Bleckley, jump in an airplane. And they go off to try and find this unit. And they couldn't find them. They came back and said, gas me up. We're going out again. We've got to find them. I can't believe we can't find this unit. And they find them. They come in and they drop. And the first time they drop, they miss. They didn't have precision. They came back around a second time, lower and slower, and they dropped again. But in the process of dropping, they were shot down and they were killed. They were awarded the Medal of Honor. Perhaps you don't remember it. The year was 1918. The aircraft was the DH-4. It was the Argonne Forest, the Lost Battalion. Now, over decades, the material things have changed. But I'm going to offer you the ethos of what they did hasn't. They answered the call. They got in their aircraft and said, yes, we will. And they found that battalion. And they dropped. And they gave the ultimate sacrifice so that that battalion could live. Because as a result, they knew where the battalion was, and they were able to get other folks out to them. So many in that battalion lived because two airmen said, yes, we will. Now, we go fast forward to 2005, and we're up to 2 million pounds of airdrop. To 2010, and we're up to 60 million pounds of airdrop. 2011, we're going to be over 90 million pounds of airdrop. Huge number. What does that mean, Ray? A, C5, a C-17 will carry about 50,000 pounds. A C-130, about 20,000 pounds. It's about 6,000 bundles a month. And why? Because that plus up in Afghanistan, we put all those folks around the perimeter of the nation, up near the Pakistan border. And so to get their supplies, they count on airdrop because the roads are so treacherous in good weather and now full of IEDs and snipers. So we want to keep them alive. And we commit that whatever they need will be there for them. Does it make a difference? Yeah. Let's talk about Fab Atgar. This FOB is 15 miles from the Pakistani border. It's actually manned by a Romanian contingent. And their job is simply to help this village have a stable life until the Afghan national military can be there to help just support them, to thwart the Taliban. And they got a call at AUD, at DAMD, basically says, code black. We're going to be out of fuel in 72 hours. Please help. Oh, and by the way, we can't get to our DZ. It's, the road's laden with IEDs. Please help. Same as that battalion in the Argonne Forest, except they were using a carrier pigeon. So we, oh, we boy, this is going to be hard. What are we going to do? We have an AMLO, an Air Mobility Liaison Officer, by the name of Captain John Garvin. He flies out in a helicopter. 
And he looks at it and says, oh, he calls back in. There's no way we're going to get to this DZ. We have to drop within the FOB, within their facility. We don't do this because it's high risk. So he actually puts the coordinates in and sends the coordinates back, and the tactics folks start planning. OK, let's lose, use a low um, velocity, low altitude shoot, and we'll get that fuel into them. The crew takes off. They go in and drop. All but one bundle of fuel was inside the FOB and they were able to recover that bundle. Now, that aircraft commander was uh, then Captain Rick Kinn. Rick can't be with us, but his dad is here. Colonel Kinn, will you please stand up for a second? Here's how close the family goes. Father, retired Air Force Colonel, works for GE as a program manager stationed up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Would you please tell your son and his crew how proud we are of what they accomplished to help save these gentlemen's lives? Thank you, sir. And John Garvin, stand up. That's Captain John Garvin right there, the AMLO. In fact, all the AMLO, stand up for a minute, guys. OK, air mobility, good, and sit down. So John's out there, and we drop. What's the effect? The effect was they were able to regain control of the area around them, regain control of their DZ. And over the past months, come September, this Romanian contingent was so successful, they were able to turn over this FOB, this forward operating base, to the Afghan National Army. They got home safe and sound because our air mobility liaison officer, our tactics folks, our crews, were able to, in part, help sustain them when they needed it most. And so now you have great success because the Afghan National Army is now there to provide stability because that village is right next to the FOB. So think about the history yet to be written because we, in part, helped this wonderful team. Now, it's just not about FOBs. A call came in from the province of Nuristan. Nuristan is this village in the base between two large mountains. And they said, help. The Taliban have surrounded us. They're cut us off. We're facing starvation. Is there any way you can possibly get us some food? And so again, the tactics folks said, yeah, we can do this. But the issue is kind of different because we can't drop on the village. We have to drop at the base of the mountain. Once again, the tacticians, the maintainers, they generate the aircraft. And Major Chris Ott and his crew, Moose 74, take off. But a dilemma is they're getting ready to take off. This DZ, there's no one to sustain it, to maintain it, to protect it. So if they drop, as they make up this DZ, the Taliban will be right there and grab it all. So they go to the ISAF forces, and they say, hey, can you help us out? The ISAF forces there have the Afghan National Army flying in helicopters, and the Afghan National Army secures this drop zone. Huge. And in the meantime, Chris Ott and the crew had gone to the Bagram, Bagram riggers and said, look, we need some help. I know you're rigging 120 bundles today, but can you throw 40 more on? Can you throw on 62,000 pounds of rice and tea? They called it a drop of a million cups of tea, 4,000 pounds of tea bags, and then another 58,000 pounds of rice. So at 17,000 feet, they take off, and they drop all of the bundles on the drop zone. Huge. Chris, are you, you're out there, aren't you? Stand up for me a minute. What was the, uh, did you ever get the feedback of how the drop went? Uh, yes, sir, we did. There was actually a uh, B-1 that was supporting us that day, uh, providing cast support and also ISR. And uh, in the debrief, we had an opportunity to uh, witness or view their pod footage. Um, and what we saw was uh, the picture that's up there. All the bundles uh, right where we intended along the roadway just prior to the village. They were recovered by the Afghan army and, and distributed. So it was a great success. So you're not lucky. You're just really good. Uh, both. Okay, we like that. <laughs> okay, now. That's a pretty good shot pattern from 17,000 feet. And guess what? Those citizens got to look up, and they didn't see a machine of war if they saw it all. They saw wings of hope. But here's how it plays forward. What did the people also see? They saw the Afghan National Army, and that's a foreign entity to them. They saw them come in and secure a drop zone. 
they saw them come in and grab those bundles of food and distribute it to the villagers and keep the Taliban thwarted to help this village survive. So think about the respect that occurred between the civilians and the military there that you had no idea that you were part of, but because you were able to do what they did, we're writing a whole different history of how the military would be respected in that village. Absolutely huge. But what if we didn't need to have that drop zone? What if we could have just dropped over the village? And we talked about this last year with the Hope Bundle, to get rid of that 2.3 pound you know, ration and actually just have food or water floating down with six ounces at 17 miles an hour. And we're actually going to flight test that this, this spring. It's around the corner, so General Frazier will be a capability that you can offer to combatant commanders in the State Department that within 18 hours, we can be anywhere in the world, no matter what the terrain, no matter city or urban, that we can respond with humanitarian assistance. A huge capability that you're providing. And the second thing we talk about is precision. We needed precision back in 1918 with Gettler and Bleckley. We need precision now. If you think back in World War I, Newton was our friend because if you dropped the bomb or dropped food, it was going to hit the ground. So we knew that was good in this, and that was good enough. But then you go through World War II, and we come up with the Norton bomb site. We become precise with the aircraft guiding how that dumb bomb was going to hit the target. And then we get radar bombing. And then recently in history, we have smart munitions. We put a GPS kit on the front of a dumb bomb and some fins, and it can steer itself and put itself right through the window of a building. Smart munitions. And if you think about where have we gone with airdrop, we have our CDS where we drop, okay, and we have winds help the parachute. We drop a sauna buoy to get the winds. And now we are now getting to smart bundles by putting GPS on the bundle and having steerable parachutes. We're getting there, but it's expensive and it's bulky and it's not working as well as we need it to work yet. So industry, again, please help us to miniaturize this, make this as inexpensive as the JDAM kit so we're not worried about recovering them. We talk about being able to put a weapon into somebody's window. Okay, we don't need that. I just want to put the bundle on their front door and hit the bell and say it's here. Okay, we can do this. I need your help. You know, we talked about March Madness, and I talked about the first call. The second call came in, it was kind of like this. How quickly can you get 24 135s and four KC 10s to Marone? Why? Well, the UN has just passed his no-fly zone, but more importantly, Gaddafi is about to unleash his own military on a civilian populace. He's going to kill his own people. We have to keep them at bay. And how are we going to do that? We'll build this coalition of fighters, but until we can, General Welsh and the USAFE will take those fighters down. But they don't have the loiter time over Libya. The Navy's coming in, steaming in, so we need to basically have tankers there to help give us the loiter time for the ISR and the strike assets over Libya to keep this military at bay. Of course, Mildenhall is going to be involved. The call comes into the TACC, and we take some of those tankers that are moving the fighters back and forth and bed them down at Marone. We also have six tankers in Puerto Rico. They're just completing that presidential move through South America, and I kid you not, talking to the crews, sir, we got one pair of clean underwear left. We're heading home. Guys and gals, guess what? There's a laundry mat in Marone. Take off, head east. You can do your laundry when you get to Spain, and that's what they did. Then. We looked around what was left in the CONUS, and the active duty was so deployed, we turned to the Guard and Reserve. We said, we need help, and by the way, it's volunteer help because they don't have mobilization authority. And it was amazing. I needed a general officer. I called General Roy up the graph, the commander at the Pittsburgh Guard Unit, and said, Roy, can you take this mission? He goes, sir, how soon do you need me to leave? I said, tomorrow. He said, sir, I got it. On that phone call, on a volunteer basis, he was deployed for 93 days. And all across our country, units came together and said, let's move the mission. We had a young airman at McConnell who basically got a phone call. He was taking his wife out to dinner, get to the squadron. He was wheels up four hours after that phone call. We had a young airman up at Fairchild who call, gets called in, and he's on the road with his girlfriend. He shows up, and they say, hey, you need to deploy. Go into Marone. And he's looking a little peaked, and the, the uh, flight chief goes, what's the matter? He goes, well, my girlfriend's in the car. Okay, well, we're on our way to get, you know, to elope. We're getting married today. 
And I go, oh, okay. So being a good, and it's actually his flight chief is here. I'm not going to dime him out. But his flight chief says, okay. And the section chief, go get married and get your butt back here tomorrow. <laughs> so he gets married. Honey, welcome to the Air Force. Okay. Here's the keys. Here's the car. Oh, and by the way, I'll be home in a couple. I'm not sure. He was gone for three months on a phone call. So over that period of time, 534 airmen, primarily Guard and Reserve, came together and flew to Marone. They basically descended upon Marone Air Base. There was an Air Base squadron commander by the name of Rule Flores, lieutenant colonel with about 115 airmen there and about 400 contractors. He was two weeks to retiring so proud, and we invaded the poor guy. <laughs> and what happened? His chow hall was actually down being refurbished. He actually took the club and converted it to a chow hall. The bar full of booze, you get rid of all that, that became the in-flight kitchen. And that night, 19 units all descended at Marone. And when they did, some of the crews went to bed, but our maintainers, our tacticians, our porters, our security forces all went together to turn those aircraft. And the next morning, that armada took off and went to work for General Woodward at 17th Air Force and ultimately NATO and actually put that cover and made contact with those fighters in ISR to keep it overhead. Now, I'm very proud to tell you, as of 31 October, just a couple of days ago, the last mission was flown. All the folks are coming home from Marone. And Roy, can I have you stand up, please? In fact, if you were part of this operation, Marone, would you all please do me a favor, just stand up? I just want to give you a huge round of applause. So if you've been part of those airmen who deployed to Marone, stand up. Thank you, guys. And again, this is done on volunteer status, on phone calls. That's how much we've come to depend on our Guard and Reserve. And that's the kind of response they give us every day. So 12,000 air refuelings, 170 million pounds of fuel, big number. What does it mean? There's folks in Libya today that look up and have no idea that there were ISR and fighter aircraft overhead who were helped keeping that military at bay, who were striking before they could strike. They have no idea that some of those fighters in the ISR were supported by tankers, coalition tankers, tankers from Mildenhall, tankers from the CONUS. And they have no idea that all these airmen, instead of saying goodnight to their families, said goodbye at a moment's notice to go do that. Think about the capability our country can bring, our Air Force can bring, on a phone call to respond to say, yes, we can, to answer the call. They have no idea, but the history that's in front of them is bright because in part, in part, you helped shape that. And you did it with 50-year-old and 30-year-old aircraft. Unbelievable. And you know what? We're going to continue to sustain these, but it is so nice to be here and say, guess what? The KC-46 is around the corner. It's coming. Okay? And in 2017, August to be exact, we're going to have 18 of our aircraft working for us. They'll come from the factory and go right into whatever operation we need them to do. But that doesn't lessen the importance of what we're trying to do with our existing aircraft. Because in all the coalition air refuelings, we use these wing pods because that's what the coalition fighters use. And they're called warp and nippers, two names on the different aircraft. And they're working, but they're not working well. So we need to continue that effort to keep that capability going because having the coalition there was absolutely huge. And even things as simple as lighting on a 135. We've improved the lighting on the inside of a 135. Why? Well, guess what? In 1965 was the first time we ever used the KC-135 for air medical evacuation. And we learned in working with the French that we have a better lighting system, and our folks have just improved the stanchions because it's a wonderful platform. And we talk about back in Vietnam that it took us 45 days to get you from point of injury to the major hospital back home. In Desert Storm, we were down to 10 days. And now we say we're down to three days, but if you're seriously wounded and hurt, we'll get you from the hospital, no matter where you are, to any hospital in the world in a matter of hours. And we'll talk about that. And so the survival rate's gone from 75% in Vietnam to, we say, 94 to 98% now, depending upon where you measure it. But that's not good enough. 
So what we're going to do is we started in July as we took those critical care teams that give us that capability from the surgical suite to anywhere in the world, and we're putting them even further forward. Because if you're injured, they get you to a, the first surgical station. And from the first surgical station, they get you to the field hospital. Well, we're losing people from the first surgical station to the hospital, so we're now we're going to take some of our critical care folks and put them in the back of a Humvee or helicopter and help keep people alive until we get them to the field hospital, going after that last 2%. And we call these fakes tackets. A new capability had just started, and guess what? The Army is so impressed with it that they're going to be doing it too. So here's a case where we're not going to get there until we're done, because saving lives are important. And we always talk about the back end of the aircraft. But really, what we do is a two-part. The crew, can they get the aircraft there, and can the back end, the AE folks and the CCAT keep the patient alive and sustain them until we get them to follow on care? And a call came in from McMurdo, the South Pole. And I tell you what, the call said, hey, we need to get somebody off the ice because we don't think she's going to make it through the winter. Now, our summer is their winter, and McMurdo Station looks really nice in the summer, but when you get the call, and it's this time of the year, it's pitch black. And a year ago, we would not have been able to get this person off the ice. But because of the innovation of our crews using night vision goggles, guess what? We can now use night vision goggles and land at McMurdo. And we just did that. So the call comes out, and our crew, we have Colonel Vaughn, we have Colonel Wellington, and we have Chief Simpson, a mission planner, a mission commander, and they get there and say, we're going to do this. So they take off from uh, Lewis McCord, and they blast off with the C-17. They pick up an AE team uh, from Kadena that goes to Hawaii and a CCAT team. They blast off down to Christchurch, and they get down there on the ice on night vision goggles. They're on the ice for 42 minutes. They pick up this patient, and they get her up to Christchurch. And because they were able to say, yes, we can, to save her life, she's alive and doing well today. And that's something we could not have done last year. So the importance of this innovation is absolutely huge. And we continue to do this with ICE missions time and time again. And one of the things that probably most impresses me, we talk about AE, is this thing called innovation. I'm amazed at how well you innovate. We had a situation, Sergeant Tom Moore, infantryman, working on an MRAP in Ramadi. And he's discharging his fire extinguisher system. That's the last thing he remembers. Because when he discharges his fire extinguisher, hits him in the chest, puts him down, he stops breathing, and his heart stops. We're not sure how long he's out, but he's out. In fact, um, while I'm talking about this, Captain Hargy, um, Haggerty and uh, Captain St. Admin, will you come up here with your crews, please? And also, um, Sergeant Massey, you out there? Come on up here, guys, while I talk about this. So some of his army brethren, because they knew first aid buddy care, get him to a helicopter, get him to the hospital Balad. And there, Captain Haggerty, as he comes up, or raise your hand there, Captain Haggerty. Okay, you are awful young to be this important of a doctor. Okay, but he's in charge. <laughs> I'm an old person. You like to go to a doctor who's older than you and makes you feel good, but this man is a lifesaver. So he gets him in there and says, what are we going to do? He's breathing, he's, ble uh, he's got a pulse, but he's not, he's comatose. And we're concerned, how long was he down for? Does he have permanent brain damage? And we're in the middle of a field hospital, so how are we going to get him to care? We don't want to try and bring him back. So he goes, hypothermia. Now, since he's a doctor, you probably said therapeutic hypothermia, but let's chill him. Now, he hasn't done this in, you know, Iraq before, so he's literally on the Internet saying, okay, let me look this stuff up. The instructions are, go get ice and chill the guy down, right? <laughs> He went to med school for that. Okay, now, so, so they do that, and they go around the base. They're to the chow hall and to the fire department getting nice, and they put all around them. That's good. Then they take the blender, and I, he didn't tell me this, and they put the blender on, put ice in it, and put ice down his stomach. They also put ice up his bladder. Then they take IV fluids and chill them before they're putting them in, and then you're concerned about brain swelling, right? So you put a small hole in his head to monitor the pressure and to see if his brain was swelling. You get his temperature down to 90 degrees, okay, 89 to 93. Then how are we going to get him to launch stool as quickly as possible? That's where the CCAT team, Captain St. Emin, comes in, and you get the call and say, you're taking this guy to launch stool. 
hey, cake run. Just put him in the airplane, get him there six hours later. And then Sergeant Massey's the loadmaster there. But this one's a little different. How cold can you keep the C-17? Because guess what? We have to keep him chilled until we get him to launch stool. And then you were ha actually handing out blankets, if I remember correctly. Hang can you make it pretty cold in that airplane? Yes, sir. Can you get it down low, below 40 degrees? Uh, below 30, sir. OK. okay. Give, give him the microphone. <laughs> How cold can you make a C-17? At, at least below 30, sir. It went down. There was freeze, frozen water on the uh, ramp when we were done. So you were below 30 degrees in the back of the airplane? In the back. They were taking ice off of the patient because it was so cold back there. Okay, I'm good, I'm good. I buy it. Okay, so now, but, but here's the thing. Then our good CCAT doctor says you need to go faster. His heart rate is down to like 30. He's not very stable. And you're not sure they're going to keep him alive. And you never know what's going to go south on that aircraft. So the crew basically starts calling with Ankara Andy, the controller, and with Prague, and with Germany, and they get basically nonstop into Germany, into Ramstein. They cut 30 minutes off that aircraft time to try and save his life. And they get him to launch stool. He gets there and they start, well, let me get the microphone to our good CCAT. So they got him at launch stool and what happened then? Uh, yes, sir. They, per the protocol, they kept him cold for another 20 hours and then they slowly rewarm him. Uh, and by all reports, uh, he woke up, started to walk and talk and called his family and uh, he's doing just fine today. Yeah, I heard that he went down to Brooks and he kind of did that. But you really don't know what happened yet, do you? No, sir. Uh, hey, Sergeant we... Moore, are you out there? <laughs> Just want to say thanks for, uh, well, the reason why I'm still here is because of y'all, so I'm kind of happy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a speaker, and I'm nervous, though. <laughs> he's been here all week. And all week, the crew's been talking about what's happened to him. And he's been kind of walking around incognito as a member of the transcom staff as some you know, taxi cab driver. So he's been here all week kind of checking you all out. But we just wanted you to have a chance to see the person whose life you saved. And then what we'd like you to do is go off stage a little bit and kind of catch up, because they have a lot to tell you about how close you came because you have no idea, but you know the good news is look at the smile on your face and look at the future in front of you because you all, as a team, were innovative and you did magnificent work to keep him alive. One person. Congratulations. Thanks so much. The lives you touch and the faces. So often we think that we're the ones who are going to give this deliver hope, fuel, fight, and save lives. And we are. But in a moment, fate can turn all that around. And we can go to the people that need help. And in fact, that occurred on the 25th of April on a night that Little Rock Air Force Base called Miracle Monday. A tornado came ripping through the base. It affected and destroyed 200 facilities, 130 homes, and five aircraft. The miracle was that no one was severely hurt. And Colonel Mike Minahan kind of coined that phrase, Miracle Monday. It was. But here's the other miracle that occurred. A call didn't go out. The community from Larry Bernacki, Phil Davis, honorary commanders, first responders from across the community came on base and said, we're here to help. We're here to make sure all these airmen have a place to sleep, that it will be dry, that have food, that have clothing. And we got down there just a, a few days, a week or so later, actually, and you should see the size of the donations. But that's not where the story ends, because the 41st Squadron and the 50th Squadron were facing a deployment. In fact, the next day, they were supposed to start deploying to go to Iraq and Afghanistan. Could they do it? Could they leave their families behind? And if you're a single person, your car, your whatever, your whole life has just been torn apart. But could you go forward and deploy with Daesh and Yakota? And their answer is yes, we can, because they knew the community and their fellow airmen would take care of everything. Think about it. 
You're going to start processing the next morning to deploy and go halfway around the world when a tornado just ripped through your base and had huge effect on your life. One of the folks deploying was a senior airman we talked about last year called Brian Petrus. Remember, he came back from a deployment and faced cancer. He had his leg, part of his leg amputated, and what he focused on was how to go from surviving that to thriving as he pedaled across the country, and his squadron became that measure of resiliency. We talk about comprehensive airman fitness. Well, guess what? He's now staff sergeant, and he was going back out because he's been flying the line, and he was one of those folks that was deploying forward. Absolutely huge to see how an airman has continued to grow because of this family we call airmen and community. So the next day they started processing, and the next two weeks, 400 went forward. And when they got there, they did the normal stuff, moving people, equipment, and airdrop. But the folks on Iraq, Chrome 4 or 5 crew specifically, were going to load some people up and move them. And as the people came on, they said, boy, some of these folks are wounded. What are we doing this time? He said, well, this is Operation Proper Exit. Um, Colonel Julian, Tim, will you come up here with your deployers uh, as you're coming up? Chrome 4-5 went off, and they were basically moving some wounded warriors who were returning to Iraq to the place where they were injured so they could leave Iraq at a place and time of their own choosing. And one of the folks they were picking up in the airplane was Staff Sergeant Bobby Hemline. Bobby, would you come up? You're here. <laughs> Not paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> So Bobby's on the airplane, and he's in the front as he's talking about. In 2007, he was in, in a, uh, a vehicle, a Humvee, and he was the only person of his crew of five that survived. And so he's on the aircraft with the crew. Bobby, if you would, just a moment, please. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to be here tonight to thank everybody um, in the Air Force for what you do. Uh, for us wounded warriors, I want to thank you from me, from my family, from under wounded warriors and their family, because you were a crucial part of us being alive today. And I just now found out about the parachutes. Um, I'm being a paratrooper, I would love to have a smart parachute take me to the right spot. <laughs> but I'd also like to thank you for Operation Proper Exit. Um, once we're physically and emotionally ready, and we still need some pieces that are missing to help with us with some closure, we're able to do this. I was on the 10th one. The 70 guys have gone back on these total um, to do this. And it was just amazing. I got to meet a lot of guys that helped medevac me out, fill in those pieces and get closure. And, but one of the most memorable things that all of us remember from that trip is the very last day when we're flying back from Kuwait, or from Iraq, back into Kuwait is the crew called down and they gave us a countdown to when we were crossing that line back into Kuwait so that we can all stand up the proper way when we exit the country and that just meant a lot to us. Martinez sitting next to me right there is missing both legs. He got up on both his prosthetics and we were all just having a good time, hugging, high-fiving. It was just really amazing. It was a big part of our recovery. And just thank you very much. Here's what the crew also did. On that flight, when the engine shut down, they'd run to the back of the airplane. They'd line the back of the ramp, and so when these soldiers came off, they got to give them the proper salute, the salute they earned when they left Iraq the first time. So to me, folks, when I look at why do we do what we do, I look at what you have done, I look at the way you have done it, and in a huge way, how you've touched this one soldier's life. And, and here's how it plays around. He is a motivational speaker. He was here at a seminar today talking about how do you, no matter what is thrown your way, how do you go from surviving to thriving? And think of all the people he's touching. Think of all, in some way, you touched him to help him heal. And you wouldn't have been able to deploy unless the community was able to help you deploy. So as this plays forward, think of the beauty of what we're doing and how you touch other people's lives. 
And guys, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's just an amazing team. Thank you again so much. And you know, folks, if I look at what we do with airlift and airdrop, delivering hope, if I look at what we do with air refueling, fueling a fight, with air medical evacuation, saving lives, come on up, folks. When this whole team, as they assemble up on stage, come together, this is what we do. Our community leaders from Travis and Little Rock, because when they come together, and they represent all of us, our AMLOs, our porters, our maintainers, our security forces, our CE, this is us. And they're unstoppable. Because they'll answer the call. And think of the lives and the faces they've touched in the history yet to be written. There are children in Japan or Libya that get to go and be teachers, musicians, leaders, because they're alive. There are soldiers, sailors, marines, and coast guardsmen who have gone from surviving to thriving, who will go and be our leaders in business and our nation in the future. I don't know when the next call will come in. I don't know what the next call will ask, but I know someone, somewhere, needs something. And I know an airman We'll pick up the phone and answer and say, yes, we can. And when all of you will innovate, you'll come together and you'll find the solution so that we can answer their call. Answer their call and they can prevail in anything they need to do. Because together we're part of this great, great team. We call it mobility family, but it's part of this great Air Force that we get to serve. So God bless all of you. Thank you so much for what you do and how you do it. We're so proud of you. Folks, if you get a chance, come up and say hello to them. And we'll see you tonight. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you, General Cross.